don't forgive me for this trap shit. Sergeant Smack make it backflip. Telly Hank it with the action. With the vital speaking Spanish. Frank Matthews, how I vanish. Poof. Came back like I'm King Tut. Gold BBS is on a beamer. When Fat Cat was tearing queens up. Fall off the prop and not the re up. Fly like Puerto Rican Jesus. Uptown like I'm Baby Man. Just caught a touchdown. From the. Yo, 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 we back, it's your boy Pop a lot. Mob ties. We on our way to Pennsylvania with it. We're gonna make a stop in Pittsburgh. But we're gonna get a whole lot of money in Hazleton. All my niggas from PA, y'all niggas getting the comment box, Philly. All everywhere. Y'all niggas just tap in. But we got anybody from Hazleton, y'all niggas tap in. We need to hear from y'all. Now the guy that we're going to be covering today is going to be a guy by the name of Terrence Cole. Or if you want to go by what I want to call him, we're going to call him Terrence Duffel Bag Cole. Because he was damn sure he wasn't getting a bag. He was getting a duffel bag. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about his case. But before we do that, I guess I'm going to paint the government's picture of Mr. Cole. Now, according to authorities, Mr. Cole was just the biggest drug dealer in Western Pennsylvania history. I've seen some accounts where they say he made $10 million. I've seen some accounts where they say he made $40 million. And I've seen some accounts where they say he sold drugs that were up to $100 million. So, I'm going to let them speculate and I'm going to let y'all speculate for real, for real. But one thing I know about it he was getting to a bag, and it's going to be one, well, there's plenty of things in the story that's going to let you know that, but it's going to be one thing that's damn sure going to solidify it. So now, I'm going to kind of do this one a little bit different. I'm going to go all the way back to June 7th of 2002, because based on my coverage, on my um, research from the news fat the news articles and even the indictment it looks like this was going to be the day that changed his life forever so they're going to say on june 7 2002 terrence cole checked into a room that room was going to be number 511 at the hawthorne suites hotel at 1100 vine street in philadelphia so now before i even go any further if you ever stayed at that hotel don't eat don't call me don't do nothing don't do anything <laughs> yo get away from me how about that but if you plan on staying at that hotel don't i feel like you better not have a damn roach in your damn sock or some shit because they're gonna be on you but they're gonna say mr coles initially checked into the hotel for the weekend but subsequently arranged to stay for an additional 10 nights now after mr cole had been there for about a week the hotel manager, a guy by the name of David Bradley. If you stay there and you happen to see a dude named David Bradley and you want any mob ties type shit, boy, you better be on your best behavior or you better have your poker face on. So they said David Bradley sought to unsuccessfully locate Mr. Coles to discuss his payment arrangement for his stay. Now, on June 14th of 2002, Mr. Bradley let himself into Mr. Cole's room to see if the room was still occupied. Once inside the room, he observed plastic bags, small vials containing a white substance. Suspecting that he had just seen illegal activity in the room, Bradley contacted the Federal Bureau of Investigations, and that led him to Special Agent John Warrington. And he pretty much described what he seen to this FBI agent. Now, later in that afternoon, the agent, Mr. Warrington, and local narcotics officers met with the hotel manager at the hotel. He repeated the information that he had provided earlier to them on the telephone, and then Bradley unlocked the room for number 511 for the officers. The officers entered the room. They observed plastic bags and small vials containing a white substance that Bradley was telling them about as well as empty as well as an empty gun holster now after a few minutes the officers left the room without touching anything the government concedes that 
the entry was illegal and that the that was legal and that it does not um, require anything to establish a probable cause for the subsequent warrant for an entry list search. So um, they pretty much deem that search legal. That's, that's one thing I want to know. And that's just time for she to me. But I'm going to just keep going. Now, the office, I mean, a hotel manager, he provided the officers with access to a room adjacent from his 514 and it was located directly across the hall from the room 511 that Mr. Coles was staying in. Now, the officers established surveillance by using the peephole at the door. At some point, a sergeant by the name of Jonathan Josie, he was the supervising officer, sent the officer Barry Wilson to check additional records on Terrence Cole and perhaps to secure a search warrant and a seizure for the hotel room. Now, as Officer Wilson approached the elevator to leave the fifth floor, he noticed that two men were exiting the elevator and one of those two men carried a black nylon backpack. Now, after Officer Wilson watched the two men go into room 511, he returned back to 514 to inform the officer's position there that the two men had just entered 511. Um, there was no indication that either of the two men were identified as Mr. Cole or uh, his co-defendant at the time, who was going to be a guy by the name of Jonathan Jackson. Now, um, they it was no it was no indication that they were aware of the police surveillance. So they just kind of thought it was just a guy probably coming off the elevator and in town with his family, a businessman, hotel employee, who knows. But now, despite them having the room under surveillance, the officers decided to enter the room of 511, the Sergeant Josie, Officer Wilson, and two other officers, all dressed in plain clothes with identification badges hanging around their necks. They positioned themselves two parallel columns on the outside of the entrance of 511. Um, Miss Sergeant Josie knocked on the door, attempting to access the door, um, and said that he was with room service. The man replied and said that he ordered any room service and he refused to open the door. Um, the co-defendant later testified that that was, uh, Mr. Coles that actually answered the sergeant. Sergeant Josie knocked a second time, this time announcing that he was with maintenance and he was there to fix a leak. A voice again responded saying that there was no leak. And again, they refused to open the door. Sergeant Josie knocked a third time more forcefully, identifying himself as a police officer and telling the occupants to open the door. This is the police. Um, now the officers are saying that this was a critical juncture. So they, cause they heard sounds of rustling and running and footsteps. Sergeant Josie attempted to open the door by using an electronic key that he was given by the hotel manager, but the officers could not enter because ha <laughs> ha we put the latch on, on y'all bitch ass niggas. So my, my guy Cole got the latch on the door. So after um, they partially opened the door using the pass key, the officer heard the sounds of toilet flushing. They heard some more running and they want to say and they say eventually Terrence Cole came to the door and he opened it for officers and the police discovered pretty much um, the same thing. Some of the same things that they saw before um, several several um, containers of cocaine base crack multiple bags containing cocaine. 25 vials of crack cocaine, approximately $2,000 in cash, a firearm inside Cole's carrying bag. Um, and they say the drugs that were confiscated in that hotel room were right around 31000 So after they secured the room, they obtained a search warrant in order to search it further. And then they wanted to search uh, his rental car at the same time. So they applied for the search warrants. Um, they said that everything was legal, but it was no mention of the illegal uh, entry into the hotel room when they first encountered the hotel manager. So I want to say later on that year, on April 29th, 2003, that's going to be when Terrence Cole was indicted by the Eastern District of Pennsylvania. 
The indictment charged um, him with a possession of a firearm and the furtherance of a drug trafficking organization and possession with the intent to distribute crack base, um, cocaine and crack base, I'm sorry. And pretty much on August the 6th, at his pretrial, he filed a motion to suppress the evidence from his hotel room, saying that the violations um, violated his Fourth Amendment rights. Now that we talked about Terrence's cold, suspicious indictment, let's talk a little bit about his court dates and his trial. So he first went to trial in March of 2005. The first case was thrown out because the jury deadlocked. It was a pretty much a mistrial. They deadlocked 10 to 2. Two jurors refused to deliberate. So for the first time in the history of the court system in Western Pennsylvania, an anonymous jury was picked for the retrial of Terrence Cole. Now, jurors heard the case as usual, but their names, their addresses, and their employers were kept secret from anybody involving the case. Now, federal prosecutors said that the precaution was necessary because of suspicious jury conduct at Cole's mistrial in March, um, which is, was at that time the subject of an in, uh, ongoing investigation, coupled with the fact that Cole had an efforts to intimidate and murder government witnesses. Now, like I said, that first trial was deadlocked from 10 was deadlocked 10 to 2. And it was because of the refusal of holdout jurors. A guy by the name of Kevin Lewis, 28. Shout out to you, Kevin Lewis, if you tuned in. Shout out to your whole mom, my nigga. And uh, he was of Homestead. And another guy by the name of Joseph Oslin, 49 of Apollo. Um, they refused to deliberate. Now, prosecutors at that time, they refused to comment on any investigation, but the sealed court papers filed since then have revealed that it was concerns that the jury was indeed compromised. And US, it was U.S. attorney at that time, a female by the name of Mary Beth Buchanan, they confirmed that the FBI was actively looking into that first trial. So after that debacle at the first trial, you know the government was not going to play with this nigga. And if the first trial ain't blow your mind, watch this shit. So not only did the government come with the secret jury, they had his plug on the stand ready to testify against him. A guy by the name of Miguel Duran, 38 years old, Dominican, from New York. He testified that he funneled millions of dollars worth of cocaine to Terrence Cole and his organization. Um, now, Duran claimed that he first met Cole in 1991 at a repair business, a repair car shop in East Liberty, when him and another drug dealer, whom name he also dropped, a guy by the name of Lowell Bunny Hines, they sold several kilograms of coke to Cole at that location. Duran said his workers would ship cocaine to Cole's affiliates and hidden compartments and Cadillacs and then Mercedes Benzes. And he said that he was his number one client in Pittsburgh. He testified that one shipment fetched so much money that he couldn't stuff the cash into the hidden compartments for the trip back to New York City. And he told Cole to pay with larger dominations in the future. So he was talking about like telling him to pay in 50s and 100s, fuck them 5s and 1s. So Duran's largest shipment from what he testified to Cole was 100 kilograms to, from which Cole made 2.2 million. He said Cole became such a valued customer that he gave him a diamond encrusted Rolex watch at the trial. Um, and he said that watch was worth over 25,000. And he said that on one shopping spree in New York City that Cole bought a pair of shoes that was worth $2,000. And now we talking about in 2004, 2005, but he said he met him in the early 90s. So this was going on from 91 to 2003. So that kind of puts that in perspective. So, you know, the government kind of shut him down just man they had his plug man his plug testified against him let me put that in perspective to you guys that would be like big meech testifying against blue da vinci 
yo, this shit is just so fucking wicked out here. Um, they actually had the transcripts of the whole trial where he talked about he him giving Cole the cars and all kind of shit. So he pretty much did that from based based on my research. He did that to lighten his sentence and not get back deported to the Dominican Republic. But not only that, they had another guy by the name of Gary P. Smith, who was 47 years old, who was Cole's one of Cole's top two lieutenants in his organization from Second Avenue and Hazelwood. Um, he pleaded guilty to to distributing cocaine. From 1991 to 2003 with the organization, he faced at least 20 years behind bars with the U.S. attorney at the time. They asked for a reduced sentence for him. This was after Cole was convicted in August because he gave extraordinary cooperation. Now, you hear that? He didn't cooperate. He gave extraordinary cooperation. Man, they got an A plus in the cooperation category. So it was said that. Um, after Terrence Cole was convicted of the offense, people in Hazelwood would be walking around wearing free Terrence Cole t-shirts. Um, witnesses at the time told the newspaper, which was the Post-Gazette, that the shirt showed pictures and names of government witnesses under, under it with the word snitch. The, the police in the city, they would, they started to look into the shirts and they found some. Um, they pretty much was trying to, I guess, see who was responsible for this after Terrence Cole was convicted. And they said one of the shirts featured a picture of Mr. Smith with another one of his lieutenants, a guy by the name of Tommy, Fat Tommy Gilliam. If y'all see Fat Tommy, y'all niggas tell him my I said, fuck you, man. Um, and they had them framed on two pictures with assassins from the wire on that bitch. And they also had some other shirts um, that had a picture of Terrence Cole that said, don't assassinate, my, don't assassinate my character. And they also had a list on the back that said liars with the name of some of the witnesses that testified against Terrence Cole. Um, even though some of the names were misspelled, who knows if that was on purpose to kind of throw off the authorities, but who, who knows? But now that we talked about all of that and <laughs> this shit is so wicked. Watch your back. Watch your friends. Nigga, 95% of them going to turn on you. So with that being said, Terrence Cole was convicted and sentenced to life in prison. Based on my research, I saw where he went and asked for a reduced sentence sometime in April of 2015. And... The U.S. Attorney's Office objected to that request and U.S. District Judge Arthur Swab agreed, denying his request for a reduced sentence. But that's not the kicker. His plug testifying against him is not the kicker. His two lieutenants testifying against him is not the kicker. This is going to be the kicker. More than a year after his conviction, and eight months after he was sentenced to life in prison, Terrence Cole, he continued to keep law enforcement busy because on a Thursday in 2015, they searched a home in Penn Hills where Terrence Cole lived with his girlfriend. And inside a bedroom closet, they found a large locked olive green suitcase with the name Terrence Cole on it. Inside that bag, they found a black duffel bag. Inside that black duffel bag, they found $2.2 million in cash. It's your boy, Pop a lot, man. We're going to be back with more trail spill shit, man. Y'all make sure y'all follow me on Instagram, on Twitter, P-O-P underscore A underscore L-O-T. And we're going to be back with the shit for y'all, though. It's the mob, 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 ties.